for decades a pariah state, shunned and boycotted by much of the world. Then basking in the glow of a president loved by virtually everyone. This wild and beautiful country has had to earn its place on tourism's top table. On my journey, I'll come face to face with some fascinating characters, both human... <laughs> ..and most definitely not. They're actually quite magnificent creatures. He's pretty close to me now. I'll be driving along one of the most popular tourist routes and meeting the locals who shape its character, from taxi drivers to shark spotters. Down, 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 down. The people and places that make exploring this country such a unique experience. Today, South Africa is setting out its stall for the 21st century. A new chapter begins. Not easy. Table Mountain in Cape Town, 60 million years old and hundreds of millions more in the making. Over a kilometre high. I've got nothing to grip on. And a tough ascent for the novice. Whoa! It's part of why climbers climb, for the spectacular backdrop, and for that reason, Cape Town's climbers must be among the luckiest in the world. We're seeing Cape Town, I think, at its finest. We have Lion's Head on the left, Robben Island in the ocean, we've got the harbour, we've got the city centre. That is a famous island. Tell me about it. Robben Island, yes. Very famous. Famous for the reason that that was where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned and where many political freedom fighters were sent during the, the struggle. And they were looking at this mountain and seeing it as a symbol of something, a symbol of freedom. A symbol of freedom, a symbol of hope, hope for the future of, of making it to the land again um, to be free. Tourists, celebrities and politicians throng to the place where Nelson Mandela spent 18 years of his life. Now the tourism authorities are drawing on that and creating a national Mandela trail, taking in museums, former homes and even the village where he was finally laid to rest in December. However, South Africa has also been exploring its options beyond Mandela for some time now. It's a country of 11 recognised languages, multiple creeds and colours, and a population of around 50 million. Last year, it welcomed 10 million international travellers. And it's the country's cultural capital, Cape Town, that's the main draw for tourists. You know it feels right. Come on and dance with me. Cape Town is celebrated for its diversity, but the task now is to make good on the promises of the Rainbow Nation and fuse all its disparate elements together. And what better way to do this than on a new bus service that promises to connect communities that used to be worlds apart. This new route, for instance, links the city centre and shanty towns with coastal districts like Landudno, which has some of the most expensive real estate in South Africa. And it's not hard to strike up a conversation with a stranger. It's actually my anniversary today. Oh, is it? It's your anniversary? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. The My City Bus Network began shortly before the Football World Cup here in 2010, and now they're being rolled out across Cape Town. 
It may be intended as a symbol of a bright new future, but my city bus could put people like this driver out of a job. By replacing traditional minibus taxi services that for decades have been serving the poorer parts of the city. Darky, a childhood name that's stuck, works 17 hours a day, seven days a week. Not that he's downbeat, far from it. For me, to be honest, life is good. In the old days, we couldn't be allowed to be in certain places, but now, Cape Town is for everybody. But on further investigation, there are still some parts of town off limits for Darkie's van. The racism is not finished in Cape Town. Like in terms of like Lendatno, where we are going, we're going to drive past Lendatno. They don't allow us Texas to go inside, you understand? That's the most bad thing that irritates me. But even worse than that is the ongoing threat of violence. Rivalry over routes has spilled out into armed clashes between operators. One estimate puts the death toll in the taxi wars at more than 2,000 countrywide in the last 20 years. What are the worst things you've seen in, in terms of the violence in the wars? Wow, the worst violence in the taxi war I saw, it was in Delft. And few individuals, they just stop the taxi and start shooting the driver and they shoot the passengers. And some people, I think four or six passengers died in that, uh, in that inconvenience. That is the worst thing I will never forget in the taxi war. Darkie has applied to be a My City bus driver. His big hope is to escape the long hours and the threat of violence with his current job. He's passed all the tests with flying colours and says he was promised a job, but he's heard nothing yet. These people are growing up in a very different time, in a very different city to the one in which Darkie grew up. They represent the future of the place that the New York Times recently declared the number one destination in the world. These 20-somethings are known as born frees, as they have only known democracy in their lifetimes. And they're feeling, largely, very positive. Do you know how beautiful this country is? Like, besides all the negativity, we are so laid back, we enjoy life, we are trying to change. I mean, we're only like literally 10 years old in democracy, so we are getting there one day at a time. This particular crowd, they're born free, so the integration is, is, is just a lot more seamless, whereas my generation, we still have that, that boundaries of, um, it's in your mind and you, and you can't break through it, and it's just there, and it takes a lot of hard work, whereas the born freeze, they just seamlessly intermingle and integrate, and we still have that resistance. False Bay, just outside Cape Town, so named because the first Portuguese explorers in the late 15th century mistook it for the southernmost point of Africa, and hence the warmer waters of the Indian Ocean. South Africa has wildlife in abundance, and they've got a real thing here about chasing thrills by getting up close and personal with dangerous exotic animals. On land, hunting lions especially bred for that purpose, is proving a little bit controversial on the grounds of cruelty. But here in the ocean, there's one iconic creature that's more than willing to play the game. The main attraction here is the great white shark, the lion of the sea, the apex predator, as our tour operator called it. In order for a white shark to pass the cage, we have to interact with it by attracting it with the, the decoy and the tuna head. And it would attempt to go for it, and it's like a cat and a mouse game. We try and lure it, lure it as close as possible to the cage. It's true this little rocky island has one rich source of nutrition. 60,000 seals live in this colony. But to ramp up the odds, bags of frozen fish are mashed up to lure the sharks. This bait is called chum. 
And you have to obey. Stand by down, down, get down! There may be 3,000 sharks in the water, but only 480 have been spotted like this over the years. Look how close that is! Wow, Up to 5,000 tourists go cage diving with sharks a week. It's big business in Cape Town now, but surfers and environmentalists argue that luring sharks into shallower waters by chumming and then giving them no food puts both the sharks and local swimmers and surfers at risk. The shark cage diving operators beg to differ, of course. We are in an area uh, where sharks naturally range to, to, to hunt seals. So the island itself is a natural chum slick. Uh, all the feces and throw-ups from seals um, goes into the water. So there's always, always chum in the water, and that's what attracts the sharks to this area. There have been only seven attacks reported in the last year in the whole of South Africa, so it's important not to exaggerate the problem. But you can still see carved into this surface feet the reason why sharks and people don't necessarily mix. The one jaw is on this side and the other jaw was on that side, so it just bit me like that. But I was on my stomach, so I was like this, and it bit me from like that, and then it went down. Andrew was lucky. He was rescued by another surfer, and his feet survived the ferocity of the bite. But he blames the shark viewing industry for the attack. Now that people are using it for tourist attraction, I'd say, by chumming. Um, obviously, it's increasing the shark population, especially in False Bay. Coming up after the break, I joined the Backpacker Trail to one of South Africa's tourism hotspots to find out how one set of persistent burglars are being chased out of town. And I go eyeball to eyeball with an animal that packs four times the punch of a great white shark. Okay, I think that's close enough. <laughs> I'm on a journey to see how South Africa is evolving post-Mandela and what kind of experience it will offer for travellers. Time now to get out of the city of Cape Town and head east into a more rural landscape. Oatshorn is just off the garden route, about three hours from Cape Town. South Africa's ostrich farming capital, it actually claims to have the world's largest population of the bird that famously can't fly. But I'm not here to meet them. No, this is a world's first experience. Okay, I think that's close enough. <laughs> Never been open to the public until recently, I'm told, which is reassuring. To move a 
Jason and Hannibal seem pretty chilled out today, so snacking on a common or garden BBC presenter didn't seem high on their priority list, which was a bit insulting in a funny kind of way. They're actually quite magnificent creatures. He's really close to me now. Uh, and we look at them really closely. They're actually remarkably beautiful, really. They live to 120 years old. But when they snap, you get very scared. They snap. Craig has worked at the ranch for 12 years, and he says, unlike sharks, crocodiles see humans as prey and are therefore much more lethal. Crocodiles are river edge hunters, so sharks you'd have to go in quite deep, I would assume. Even though there have been quite a few bites up in the shallow waters, crocodiles are unforgiving and uh, they'll take you out on the river edge. Crocodiles will sneak up quite close to the water, especially in the wild where the water is a bit murky and they can get right up close to their prey without their prey even knowing that they're there. And then all of a sudden they lunge out, grab their prey, pull it back into the water. So it's from the crocodile's mouth and into the lion's den, so to speak. Well, a crowded bus with a bunch of human backpackers. Two five to Nizer. Sharp, sharp. Most people who travel down the garden route use their own transport, but if you want to be with adventurous, cool fellow travellers, then there's only one way. On a bus. Baz bus, to be exact. Every year, the Baz bus ferries more than 10,000 backpackers along the coast between Cape Town and Durban, stopping at all the major towns and beaches en route. Chilean, Belgian, German, Dutch, Swiss, and one South African was the United Nations roll call on our bus. And you started out at 9 o'clock this morning, so you've been travelling about nine hours on this bus. Yeah, um, but they've been stopping at uh, every backpacker's lodge, picking up people, dropping people, but uh, I must confess it's been an incredible ride meeting, meeting people from all over the world and all these youngsters. It's just amazing. And to our final stop, the resort town of Nisner, a popular hiking paradise in the Western Cape, and thanks to its Mediterranean-style climate, surrounded by lush forest scenery. Some properties here are amongst the most prized and expensive in the whole of Africa. But peace in this coastal idyll has been rudely broken in recent times. I'm in the hills of Nisner now, looking over the town, and I'm about to enter a luxury residential complex called the Pazula Estate. Now, as you might imagine, they are very, very into security here, and there have been crack teams of intruders in recent years. But those intruders aren't human, they're baboons. In Pazula, three troops of baboons are the main culprits, wreaking havoc on the exclusive estate whose residents have included the likes of Roger Federer and former South African cricket captain Graham Smith. This man, the Jean-Claude Van Damme of Pazula, is in charge of operations to repel these invasions. Yeah, they, they like, the, um, I would like to say, a little strike force, mm. which is going to just attack grab, run type of thing. Yeah. yeah, That's what I've got them now to, where before they, would, they wouldn't move. They would just sit there and they, they weren't scared of humans. Okay, now what I, my goal was to get the baboons back to be scared of humans, see a human as a predator, so therefore not hang around and sit and basically be more a baboon. Each troop is led by an alpha male who calls the shots, although the loose cannons are renegade, dethroned alpha males. 
Leonard ultimately blames humans for not disposing of waste properly, preferring animals to live naturally. And he has his own counter-intelligence strategy down to a fine art. My goal was to control the alpha males and I became a baboon. I think like a baboon, I do like a baboon and I'm the alpha male on the whole estate. I've got also monitors and they also classified as an alpha male. And one of those monitors is Emily. She walks 20 kilometers a day on patrol and her job is to react to any reports of break-ins. Zij kunnen er nou weer jaar van naar huis af. Dan hulle kruip achter een bosje weg. Zij een stukje loopt, dan hoor je hoor iets achter jou rug. Zij omkijkt en zien je iets weer achter jou rug. Zo, so, hulle is net zoals een mens. Hulle is, hulle is slim, hulle is die domme. But the operations against Pazula's public enemy number one have been very successful. In 2011, there were 36 baboon raids, down to 28 the following year, and then zero in the past 12 months. And since Leonard and Emily started their work, house values have tripled, and the homeowners are very happy indeed. However, down in the town, there are no patrols, and problems persist. They actually gained access over here. Ian Fleming, a photographer, came back from a short holiday to find his customised dream home had been raided. They ripped curtains down. Uh, they, they removed most of the soft furnishings. Uh, they urinated on the couch. They then went into the kitchen and pantry area where they virtually ripped every bit of food out of the cupboards. It was scattered all over the floor. If baboons didn't do this, would you think they were cute animals? I still think they're cute animals. <laughs> um, us South Africans love animals. Um, we, we, uh, I think some guys in certain parts of the world would pull the nine mil out and go and shoot them. We don't do things like that in South Africa. Of course, what they need downtown is a man like this, who can intimidate a baboon like no other. Yeah, well, basically, you know, you know, I try and be like a baboon, so, you know, it's... That would frighten anyone. <laughs> So as I reach the end of my all too brief encounter with Post Mandela South Africa, what have I learnt? Well first of all, this is where you should head if you love the great outdoors and natural beauty. Everyone here certainly seems to, much more than in any other country I've visited. From stunning mountain peak views to natural wildlife in abundance on land and sea, this part of the world is a godsend for adventure lovers. Add in the boost of the 2010 World Cup and the Mandela legacy factor, and the future looks promising for South Africa. I would certainly come back for more. But it's also true that the harsh legacies of apartheid and inequality remain, and you'd be a fool as an outsider not to notice or acknowledge it. It'll take generations for that to work itself through. But I do think that more international tourism will speed up that process. Let's sing our